let's do some problems in one dimensional momentum. Hopefully you watched the video where we actually exploded the carts in lab. I pressed the trigger, the carts shot apart due to the spring. The spring acts on both carts. Due to Newton's third law of motion, they must be equal and opposite. Using Newton's second law, we can make this substitution. Acceleration is the change in velocity over the change in time. And since each force must be equal and opposite, then one cannot exist without the other. So therefore, these times must be the same. When one stops pushing, the other has to stop pushing. We cancel out the times. I'll expand the delta. Distribute the masses. Now I brought all the initials together and the finals together. So we have this quantity here for the initial mass times the velocity of each object and the final mass times the velocity for each object. Well, this quantity mass times velocity is a momentum. And this is the momentum of object one and the momentum of object two before anything happens. That's the momentum of object one and momentum object two after the explosion. Well, this means the momentum before equals the momentum after. It's the law of conservation of momentum. Where did it come from? Newton's third law of motion and Newton's second law of motion. Keep in mind this works because these are internal forces. There's no other outside forces acting on the system. How do we test this in the laboratory? Well, many of you wanted to measure a distance and a time, but the stopwatches can be a little tricky. And we actually have a better way of doing this just to test the idea. We put stop locks on the track. You can see that this is twice the mass of this cart. If the forces are the same, this one has that half the acceleration. Well, in the same amount of time, it's only going to go half the distance of this one. So if we put this block 10 centimeters from this cart, we'd put this stop block 20 centimeters from the end of that cart. And then when I trigger it, they hit at the same time. And you can see that in the video. Let's just say we have the before picture, the after picture, and we see the 1000 gram cart moving at 15 centimeters per second. What would be the velocity of this cart? We can use conservation of momentum and say the momentum before is equal to the momentum after. Before I hit the trigger, they are both at rest, so we have zero momentum. Here's the formula for the momentum of each cart. We don't really have to put everything in kilograms and meters per second. It would all work out if it was grams and centimeters per second, because we're looking for a velocity here. But it, it's probably what most of you are used to. A little algebra. And we get an answer of 30 centimeters per second. But notice there's a negative sign here. Now just check this out. 500 grams times negative 30 centimeters per second would be a negative momentum. Adding to this positive momentum would give us zero. Remember, momentum is a vector. Now, everything we've done agrees with our observation that if the mass is cut in half, it's going to have twice the acceleration. So it ends up with twice the velocity of this time. Let's calculate the final kinetic energy. One half mv squared. Now you notice if I'm doing energy, I'm going to put it into kilograms, meters per second, because we're going to be working with joules. And that negative 0.3 meters per second is going to be squared, and it's going to be a positive kinetic energy. Momentum is a vector, but the energy is not. So we're just going to have two kinetic energies that are both positive. I get this much energy, kinetic. But where did it come from? There was no motion before. Well, you can see that there's a spring, right? The initial potential energy must have been the same thing. In another example from the video from the lab where I rolled the carts, we had these Velcro tab carts. I slid one into the other. That would be the before picture. And this would be the after picture. They hit and they stuck and moved together. It's an example of an inelastic collision. Can you find the final velocity? Since the carts are on a frictionless track, the only forces between them are internal, we'll use conservation of momentum. Setting up all the masses and the velocities, 
we can see that the second car has no initial momentum. We can find the initial momentum, 0.5 kilograms times 0.5 meters per second. And since the carts are stuck together, each one of these velocities must be the same. So we just factor that out. We add the masses of the carts. It's like one object. And we get a velocity of 0.135 meters per second, or 12 and a half centimeters per second, which kind of agrees with this. This is 50 centimeters per second. We're smashing into a much larger cart. So yeah, the velocity has to be substantially smaller. Let's find the change in momentum of cart one. It's going to be the final momentum minus the initial momentum of the first cart. So the final momentum minus the initial momentum, it gives us a negative 0.1875 kilogram meters per second. That's how much momentum this object lost when it struck the big one. What's the change in momentum of the large part? The same idea here for the second part. And we have the final momentum minus zero because the initial momentum is zero. And we get a positive 0.1875 kilogram meters per second. So what does this mean? It means this cart lost that much momentum. This cart gained the same amount. It's the same idea as conservation of momentum. Whatever this one lost, that one had to gain because the system must retain the same amount of momentum. Let's check out the energy. This one only has the kinetic energy in the beginning. I get 0.0625 joules. Since the masses are stuck together, I'll write it like this. Well, now I get a substantially less energy than I had in the beginning. What happened to the energy? We generated waste heat. Just take the difference. Want to find the percent efficiency of a collision like this? Take the final energy and divide by the initial. It's a lot like percent yield in chemistry. It's only 25% efficient. Now how come? Because we don't have a spring between them. If there was a spring between them, the energy would be stored in the spring during the collision and released at the end. When you have something like Velcro, it just hits and it sticks. Well, yeah, that's like friction in there and it eats up the energy. The force of friction is in still an internal force. It transfers the momentum, yet there's no outside force, so the momentum is conserved. But in the process of transferring that momentum, these things absorb energy and they don't release it back at the end. Now we have the same experiment, but this time we have a spring in between these parts, which makes the collision an elastic collision. This one's at rest and this one's coming in at 40 centimeters per second. Now let's say after the collision, we observe this cart moving to the right at 20 centimeters per second. What will be the velocity of this one? Now really we have two unknowns in an actual experiment, but hey look, we're gonna give you one, you find the other to make life a little easier for you. Conservation of momentum, you do the math. You get 0.2 kilogram meters per second. Well, that one, we don't know what it's doing, so we just write 0.5 kilograms times V1 final. And if you do the math, you should get 0.3 kilogram meters per second. And now we have to solve for V1 final. Hey, this is interesting. When you bring this over, you get negative 0.1 kilogram meters per second. Okay, we get a negative 0.2 meters per second for V1 final. This means it bounced off the spring and went backwards. Kind of makes sense considering that this thing is very big, that small. So I could picture this reversing direction. Not really sure. Plug it all back in and check it out. That's a positive 0.2 kilogram meters per second. That's a negative 0.1 kilogram meter per second. And that's a positive 0.3 kilogram meter per second. When you add them up, yeah, it works. Now, can you draw the vectors? That's the momentum before, which represents this momentum. What's the momentum after going to look like? The momentum after for object two is going to be longer. It's going to go all the way out to here. Well, the momentum after for object one is going the other way. If I put these two vectors tip to tail, we can see that they add up to the momentum before. Remember, this is vectors. Since we have a spring in here, the energy before should equal the energy after. 
one half mv squared should be equal to one half mv squared plus one half mv squared. It's working out. Now keep in mind that during the collision, the ke is going to drop a little while the pe of the spring increases. But in the second half of the collision, the pe is going to start to drop as the spring expands, increasing the ke back to the original. Well, imagine this example. We have a 1200 gram part at 30 centimeters per second, smashing into a 500 gram part at rest, but there's no Velcro and there's no spring. So for the after picture, let's say this part is moving at 15 centimeters per second. And now we want to know what this card's doing. Since these are internal forces, we'll use conservation of momentum. Hopefully you got 0.36 kilogram meters per second. The momentum of this part after, plus the momentum of this part after, and we get 0.36 meters per second for this part. Kind of makes sense. This one slowed down, that one sped up, and this one's going faster than this one. It couldn't be the other way around, or this one would have shot right through it, unlikely with parts. But now let's check out the kinetic energy. We get 0.054 joules for the initial. Here's my kinetic energies for the carts after. Well, it looks like the kinetic energy final is a little less than the kinetic energy initial. How come? No spring, folks. We lost a little energy. 0 0.0086 joules of waste heat. Taking the final energy, dividing by the initial, we get about 84% efficient collision. So it's not a spring, uh, but it's not bad either. It's pretty elastic. So they didn't stick, so we call it a partially elastic collision. All right, just one more thing to go over. We have a force acting on this mass of the cart during a collision. Of course, we can say F equals MA. We can expand the A to delta V over delta T. Bring the delta T over, and now we have something here called impulse. It's a force times a time. It's what causes a change in momentum. It's the mass times the change in velocity. So if I make a graph of this force versus time, in this example, let's say the force is constant. What's that area? It's the impulse. And it's also equal to the change in momentum. You see on the y-axis, we have F. On the x-axis, we have T. So when we multiply the two, we get an area. Now what happens when we have an actual collision? There's going to be two forces, a positive force acting on M2. During the collision, it's going to rise as the spring compresses. And then as the spring relaxes, it's going to come back down. But there's going to have to be another force acting on the first cart. Since we're obeying Newton's third law of motion, it must be equal and opposite. So it's a mirror image. So this area must be the change in momentum for this cart. And this area must be the change in momentum for that cart. I think it makes sense. A negative area gives me a negative change in momentum. This cart slowed down. That's positive area giving me a positive change in momentum. That cart sped up. And that change in momentum is known as the impulse. We use a capital letter J to represent that. Yeah, I know. It makes perfect sense, doesn't it? Okay, one more thing to go over. Um, what about the center of mass? I did a demo with the carts where I balanced the whole system on a pivot. And then I triggered the carts and they shot apart. The cart with more mass didn't go so far. The lightweight cart went really far. But the system stayed in balance. What does that tell us about the center of mass? It remained in place. Remember, these are internal forces. They can't change the motion of the center of mass. So what if we have an inelastic collision like this? Afterwards, they're stuck together. What's the velocity of the center of mass? Well, before the collision, the center of mass is over here. After the collision, the center of mass is inside these parts, moving this way. It has to be moving at that velocity. It's 1.25 meters per second. And that's the velocity of the center of mass. It has to be the same, or else it'll escape outside the carts. That makes no sense. It's got to be in there. Well, since the internal forces cannot change the motion of the center of mass, 
the velocity of the center of mass before the collision is also 1.25 meters per second. And you can see that in the computer simulations. The center of mass dot is moved at a constant velocity throughout all those problems. So you know what the practice. You got the worksheets with the keys, chapter notes with the examples. You got the lab videos. You got computer simulation videos. Funny to keep you busy.